How many of you were at the Detour event yesterday? That was an amazing day, was it not? I, I had high expectations for the launch of that new course on the life of Joseph in Philippines and from Philippines to this part of the world. But as high as my ex expectations were, God surpassed those. And you were a big part of that, so thank you so much. This morning, we're going to continue talking about Joseph. Many of you, because of work, you were not able to be here yesterday, and so we're going to look at, at one event that we kind of jumped over yesterday. I know that your, your pastor, Dr. Peter Tanshi, has been taking you all year long through a study of the book of Genesis, and Christmas is coming, so it's almost time to be finished with Genesis. But the last several weeks, you've been looking at the life of Joseph. You know, the story of Joseph, more than anything else, is the story of a dreamer. Joseph had a dream, actually had two dreams, and in his dreams, God revealed to him that one day his brothers and even his father and mother would bow down to him. The important part is not the actual bowing of his siblings and of his parents. God's communicating to him, I've got my hand on you, I'm choosing you to be a man of leadership and influence. And so God gave him a dream. He placed it on his heart. And the story of Joseph is the story of the dream and the dreamer, but even more than that, it's the story of the dream giver who's behind it all, of God himself and Joseph's relationship with the dream giver, God. You know, if you, if you think of it, after he receives this dream, he really does go on a detour. That's why we name this course Detour. That's why that's what we, we studied all day yesterday. We learned, many of us, in geometry years ago, that the shortest distance between two points is what? Is that true? Well, it's true in geometry. It's often not true in real life. I watch people cross intersections here in Manila. You need to film them doing that and turn it into a video game. It's kind of like a real-life version of Frogger, where you jump over and then you dodge over and then, uh-oh, here comes a jeepney, and so you fake left and go right. If you went in a straight line, you would probably not make it across the intersection as a pedestrian. The shortest distance between two points may be a straight line, but that doesn't mean that's the most effective path to take. And what we see in the life of Joseph is a series of detours. There's a long time between the giving of the dream and when the dream comes true. What's the dream that is on your heart this morning? Because I believe God still gives dreams. A lot of people have been disappointed in God or they believe by God. I've heard it said, expect the worst, and then the worst that can happen is you'll be pleasantly surprised. But is that the will of God, that we have that mindset as we go through life? Absolutely not, because God still wants to give dreams to his children. What's the dream that's on your heart? For some of you, it's a different job. I dream of having a job that is not just enough pesos to pay the bills at the end of each month. I would love to have a job that's more than a job. It's a career. It's an opportunity to make a difference. It's a place where I can find fulfillment and not just watch the hours and the minutes click by on the clock until I can get out of there and go home. For many of us, it's a relationship. You dream of someday having a husband or wife who loves you like you've always wanted to be loved before. Even as a young boy, I, I wanted to be married someday. I didn't think a lot about being a dad someday because I was the youngest and so I never got to help raise younger brothers and sisters, but I knew someday I wanted to be a husband. And I, I wanted a wife who was beautiful. 
I, in my world, there were two kinds of girls. There were gorgeous girls at school who didn't live very morally, and then there were godly young women at church that my mom said, that's the kind of girl you should marry. She's got a great personality. And I'm like, I want more than a great personality. But she has inner beauty. Yeah, it's hidden so far inside that I can't even see it. That's how inner her beauty is. And I, I wanted a beautiful wife, and it wasn't until I went to college that I met this young woman by the name of Ellen. And she was from the southern part of the United States, and though we both spoke English, she spoke a different brand of English than I did. It was southern English. And when we met, she's like, hey, y'all. She still says that. If I brought her out here today, she'd go, hey, y'all. And I would have to translate, hello, all of you. She had hazel eyes. Sometimes they were green. Sometimes they were gray. Sometimes almost brown. It depended what kind of lighting we were in. And I thought, this is just, this is amazing. She was beautiful. But you know what? She was also one of the most godly people who I had ever met before. She was strong. I always thought that I would want a wife that if I could just speak, she would say, yes, sir, and never ask any difficult questions or make me think. And God did not believe that was what I needed. And so he gave me a strong wife, and, and though she follows my leadership in a very good way, she keeps me from making a lot of stupid decisions along the way. God blessed and he honored that dream, but it took a long time for that to come true. And in fact, even after we got married, it's taken a long time to develop the kind of relationship that both of us always wanted to have. But on December 20th of this year, my beautiful bride, who's over there, and she will, I will pay for this later because she doesn't like this, but Ellen, will you stand up? The love of my life right there. Just say, hey, y'all, or something, yeah. <laughs> Another dream that was especially on her heart and then on my heart was to, to start a family someday. We finished grad school, we're serving our first church. It's time to start a family, Lord. And month after month of disappointment became year after year of heartbreak, and no baby came. And I didn't really share this struggle with our church family because that's pretty private when you're going through a time of infertility. And so they didn't know if we were hoping to have children or not. They thought maybe we were still waiting. In the Philippines, they don't let you wait, do they? Like two months after you're married, they're like, well, when will I be a grandmother? Long time went by. We even tried to adopt, and the adoption agency closed and went out of business. So disappointing. So heartbreaking. What about the dream? You see, that's often the case with the dream. There's detours. There, there's a delay between the giving of the dream and the fulfillment of the dream. Some of you are hoping to someday start your own business or maybe own your own home. You're waiting for that prodigal son or daughter to come home, not just to the faith, but even to you and your family. And life is full of detours. And very rarely is life linear, where the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. We see this very clearly in the life of Joseph. In the life of Joseph, his story, after he receives the dream, you would think that his role of leadership would very soon be revealed, but no, instead, he's rejected by his brothers. You're going to rule over us? Today, my kids would say, who died and made you king? You're going to rule over us? I don't think so. He was sold into slavery by his brothers to um, a passing caravan of Midianites who end up in Egypt, and then those people sell him as a slave to a man named Potiphar. Can you imagine being owned by a human being? The, the very idea of slavery is so offensive to me. 
And I think it's offensive to God because each of us is created in his own image and we're not to own other people and treat each other as property. And yet in our age today, through human trafficking, through abusive employment, policies, there's still a lot of people who are just owned by other people. You travel to the Middle East, as I do every year or so, and, and you see the devastating effects of a system that's all gone wrong, where especially women are valued just, maybe just above furniture. And a man can say, I divorce you, and that's all that happens, and the woman is thrown out, and she gets no money, and she has no rights, and it's a tragic, tragic, tragic thing that's practiced in that part of the world. He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He's served Potiphar very faithfully. She tries to seduce him on multiple occasions and he resists the temptation. And what does he get for his faithfulness? He's falsely accused. Potiphar believes the accusation of his lying wife. And then he's unjustly imprisoned for something that he didn't even do. This God is how you reward those of us who follow you. One of the most amazing parts of the story of Joseph is that he doesn't become bitter because he so easily could have. Many of us in this room have experienced far less than that and wanted to turn our backs on God because you're not fulfilling my agenda, the dream on my heart, you're not making it come true. Even in prison, where he does nothing but do good, he interprets a dream for the cupbearer and also the chief baker, the cupbearer's reinstated his position. I'll remember you to Pharaoh when I get out there. And the cupbearer forgets all about him. And years go by. What about the dream? Why the delay? Why the frustration? Why the circuitous? Root that makes no sense. God's in control. If there's anybody in this world who can get something done efficiently, it's God. And yet, all through His Word, and by the way, even in our lives, God often includes these delays. He allows these detours. Why does He do that? I believe the answer to that is in this statement right here. Because God cares more about the development of the dreamer than he cares about the fulfillment of the dream. Let's read that all together. Just start with the word God. Skip because. Here we go. Ready? God cares development of the dreamer. You know, that's nice and neat when you read it on a screen. But when you're the one going through it, it's not so clear, is it? Maybe God lacks power. Maybe God lacks wisdom. Maybe God lacks love. He doesn't lack any of those things. In fact, I would say to you that the length of the delay, the depth of the, of the frustration is directly proportionate to what he's preparing you for in the future. One of the young women who worked for us at Walk Through the Bible in Atlanta. Her name is Lauren, and for a long time, Lauren wanted to be married. She dated some different guys. She had several heartbreaks along the way. About a year ago, Lauren was married, and we went to her wedding, and it was one of the most beautiful things. Lauren and her, her husband are both beautiful writers. And so their whole ceremony was a worship service, and they had both written things for each other, and everybody in the place, Ellen and me included, we were, we were just crying because to see this girl that we love so much finally receive a husband like this was just fantastic. And one of the things that she said was this. She looked at, at her husband, and she said, she said, the length of the delay and the depth of, of my frustration through the years was exceeded only by the greatness of God's answer. That's how he works. The longer the detour, the more, more confusing the path, you can be assured that God is in the process of refining our character so that we're ready for that. It would have been really easy to get Joseph into a position of authority. God can do that with a snap of his fingers. 
But what would Joseph have been like? How would he have used his power and his influence? How would he have responded to his brothers? It took a long time to develop Joseph into the leader that he needed to be. Well, eventually, he's released from prison after he's interpreted a dream for Pharaoh. He becomes the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. He helps Egypt prepare for seven years of hard times and famine by being great stewards during seven years of abundant harvest. They stockpile 20% of the grain each year for seven years, and they're ready. The famine hits, and it's not just an Egyptian problem. It's, it's throughout that whole region of the world. But only Egypt is prepared. And way back home, here's his father, Jacob, his brothers have betrayed them, and they could be starved out in the same famine. They hear that Egypt has grain. They go to, they go to Egypt. They buy grain. Joseph's in charge of the grain. He sees them, but he doesn't tell them who he is. And they don't recognize him. They haven't seen him since he was 17. And they sold him to that passing caravan. He's now 39. He's not just aged, but he looks fully Egyptian. His hairstyle, the way he shaves, what he wears, they don't recognize him. They buy grain, they take it home. The famine continues and they need more grain, and so they head back to go visit Joseph again. And now comes that time, that special time in the story where we're going to find out what's Joseph going to do. It's time that he show them who he really is, but what's he going to do with them and to them? If you have your Bible this morning, open it up to Genesis chapter 45. That's got to be the longest introduction to a message I've ever given in my life. But you have to understand the context to appreciate the story. Genesis 45, we're just going to look at eight verses together. We begin in verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. This, this truth that these are my brothers and we're finally back together. I've got to tell them. It seems in their first visit there's some games being played back and forth. I think he's testing them to see if they've changed at all. And I think he's also struggling with his own heart. Will I exact revenge upon them? Or will I pursue reconciliation? And now he's made that decision. And it's not so much based on his brothers, but it's based on what he's learned about God's character. And it's time to let them know who he really is. And he says this. He says, have everyone leave my presence. You know, only powerful people can make a statement like that. <laughs> you, you, you go out after this service, let's meet back by the escalators. I want to see the chaos that happens as this many people leave this space. And just try something while you're out there and near the bottom of one of the escalators. You know, it's, it's just, it's full of people. Just simply raise your hands and, and say, have everyone leave my presence. And see how well that works for you. Only powerful people can do this. Let's say our president, President Obama, comes to meet with your president, President Aquino, and they both have large entourages. There's a couple hundred people in the room, and the press is there filming it. And they, they've exchanged greetings, and they've been pleasant. But now they're in a conversation. And they want to have a deep talk about Filipino-American relationships. I could see your president or my president saying this, may I have the room, please? You know what that statement means? Everybody get out of here. All non-essential personnel evacuate immediately, and by the way, you are all non-essential. I want to talk to my friend, the president of this other nation. And that's what Joseph does. Everyone complies. There was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly. If you read through this account from Genesis 37 through 50, especially during the reunion with his brothers, multiple times he weeps. What a weak, wimpy man. 
So men, we make excuses. I'm not crying. I'm, my eyeballs are perspiring. That's one of the things my father taught me. Real men cry. Real men cry at the things that makes God cry. And he weeps, and he didn't just go. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard about this. And Pharaoh's own household got the report because this man is high up and powerful, but he's also loved and respected. And if Joseph is upset, a whole lot of other people are upset. Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Can't you just imagine their reaction to that? Gulp. Uh-oh. I am Joseph. First question, is my father still living? His father has assumed that Joseph has been dead now for years and years and years. Joseph wants to know, is my father still alive? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Why? Because they're terrified at his presence. Different cultures express this differently. We say, I was shaking in my boots, like that. I grew up with a pathological fear of public speaking. The first group I spoke to, just a dozen or a couple dozen people, my legs were literally doing that. People would talk about your knees knocking together. I didn't know they actually do that. They actually do. They can, they can knock up against each other. Who knew? I'm glad this wasn't the first assignment where God gave me to speak. You are a scary group of people. There are a lot of you out there. Now it's not my knees knocking, it's just inside my own heart and inside my own mind. But God gives peace when he calls us to do something. They're terrified, they're not just nervous. What's he going to do? How will our brother respond to what we have done for him? Why are they so afraid? Because they are full of guilt. Filipino culture, American culture, one of the things we have in common is there's an attempt to get guilt out of our vocabulary. And so we talk a lot about false guilt. You shouldn't feel false guilt. Don't be, gu guilt is a negative emotion. Guilt just paralyzes you. You need to move on behind it. And there is a kind of guilt that's bad guilt. The condemnation that we feel the refusal to forgive ourselves and, and accept God's healing through Jesus Christ. That's bad guilt. That's terrible guilt. But there's also a good kind of guilt. There's the guilt of conviction of sin. When we've done something wrong and we feel bad about it, that's one of the most loving things that our Heavenly Father does because the Bible says as a father, he disciplines those he loves. He disciplines all that he loves. So part of feeling guilt at the right times is knowing that we really are his sons and his daughters. When I, this is an embarrassing story, okay? I, I would love to be one of those speakers that travels from far away and only tells hero stories. Yes, it was a good flight on Delta. I led five people around me to Christ in the seats along with three flight attendants and the co-pilot. I'm just kind of a bionic believer, a super saint. I try to share my faith regularly, but I think we also need to be real with each other and we don't always do everything right. And this is an embarrassing story. When I was younger, probably, probably early teens, I really loved to play baseball. I wasn't a great baseball player. My son was a great baseball player. He played four years through college. My daughter played four years of softball. I'm not sure whose genes they were. They really didn't come from me. My father was there the first time my son ever hit a home run in high school over the fence. And all the dads were cheering and they're all giving high fives to me like I did something. And my father, in a very loud voice, goes, have you ever seen genes just skip a generation like that? I went, ouch, dad, that hurts. But I loved baseball. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, so I didn't have a good baseball glove. I had my dad's old glove 
from who knows what. It belonged in a museum, not on a baseball field. And this kind of, it was sort of like an animal that had just died and it was old leftover skin and you slid it on your hand and half the time balls would bounce off of it. It wasn't a very good glove at all. I wanted a good baseball glove. I asked for one for Christmas. That's not what my parents gave me. Not long after that, I had joined a club in our neighborhood. We had a whole bunch of boys our same age. We were nice kids. It was a, it was a nice middle-class neighborhood, so we weren't anywhere close to a gang, but we did some pretty dumb things along the way. And one of the things, we formed a club called the Hawk Club, like the bird, <coughs> that kind of hawk. And, and hawks would zoom in, grab their prey, and fly off. And so part of initiation into the hawk club is you needed to steal something from a store. You needed to fly in, <coughs> grab something, get out of there. Isn't this a wonderful group to be a part of? So proud of this looking back on it. I had to belong to this group. And I thought if I'm going to steal something, I'm going to steal something worth stealing. So I went to the sporting goods store and I walked around and I had a, a bag with a couple other things in it from another store. And when the store owner wasn't looking, I took the best Rawlings baseball glove and I just slipped it into the bag and then I put the other things on top of it. And I, I can remember my heart is beating out of my chest. I walked out the door of the store and I went halfway down the street before I looked behind me and no one was chasing me. And I had my baseball glove, and I love that glove. I could run down balls. I made great diving catches with that glove. I love that glove, and I hated that glove because every time I would slip it on and run out into the field, I just had this sense of guilt, and I knew that glove really didn't belong to me. I'd had that glove for a couple of months until one day my father says, you know, that's a really nice baseball glove. Where did you get that, son? I knew someday this day would come. I knew eventually he'd ask me. I had carefully built a story and an alibi, the version that I would give to them. And in that instant, I forgot all that. And all that went away. I just, I stole it. I went to the store. I put it in the bag. I covered it up. I walked out. I don't, I'm so sorry, Dad. Please forgive me. And I slid the glove across the table. And he says, you know, that's stealing and that's sin. You need to tell God that you're sorry too. I already have. Dad, I'm sorry. He says, we need to return this glove to the store, to the owner of the store. I said, you're right. Take it back to him. You need to take it back. You're right, Dad. And he goes, I don't remember stealing the glove. You need to take it back. I said, all right, call the store owner, tell him what's happened, we'll drop it off. There's the phone, he goes, I don't remember stealing the glove. You make that phone call. We went and we sat in this man's office, he comes, he sits behind his desk, he says, how can I help you? And I turned to my dad, and my dad didn't speak. He didn't even have to say a word. He just looked at me, and I read his mind. His mind was saying, I don't remember stealing that glove. And I cried again, and I gave the glove back. And the store owner, he said, people steal stuff from me all the time. And when I catch them, I prosecute them. But I've never had somebody bring back something they stole without getting caught. This is a young man of great character. I, sir, you have raised a good son. He said, son, I want you, this glove's used, I can't sell it anyway, but son, I respect you. I want you to keep this glove. And he slid it across to me. And I said, there is a God in heaven and he knows my name. And my dad quenched the Spirit of God by saying, <clears throat> that's not acceptable. I'm like, Dad, did you not hear what the man just said? I get to keep the glove. And I got rid of my guilt. 
this is fantastic. And my dad says, my son needs to work for you for free for the amount of hours to earn the money for that glove. In fact, I don't want him to forget this experience. He needs to work for you twice as much as it would cost to pay for this glove. And I can remember my dad said that, my dad denies this part of it, but I remember it. He said, I wouldn't trust him near the cash register right now if I were you. Put him in the warehouse. I said, Dad, was that really necessary? But he thought it was. That's called good parenting, is it not? I've, to my knowledge, I haven't stolen anything since then. Why? Because I don't want to go through that experience ever again. And I don't want to have the weight of that guilt. And here they are overwhelmed by this guilt to the point that they cannot even speak. Verse 4, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And so they come close. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And when they're finally close, do they recognize, you know, his eyes? Do they recognize the features on his hands? The sound of his voice finally sounds true. He probably switches from Egyptian into their native language at this point. This really is our brother. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It was not your plan. It was God's plan. Later on in chapter 50, it repeats this story in a different context, and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. This is not soft forgiveness. This is not, let's just all get along and pretend nothing ever happened. What they had done was wrong. He doesn't skip over that part. I'm not allowed to have favorite countries. Walk through the Bible, World Teach is in 126 countries. I'm not allowed to have favorite countries. If I could, Philippines would be my favorite country to visit. But I'm not, so don't clap and don't tell any of our other 125 countries that I said that. We'll edit that out of the YouTube version of this message. You know one of the reasons is because of your warm hospitality, because of your joyfulness, because you're one of the few places on earth right now that seems to like Americans, that's an added benefit. <laughs> Filipinos, travel the world and wherever you go in the world, you're welcomed. Why are there 12 million Filipino foreign workers? Well, partly because that's necessary to provide for their families, but why does it work? It works because Filipinos, wherever you go, are great ambassadors. That can be leveraged in a huge way by God for the progress of the gospel. You understand that. But part of that comes with a price. Filipinos are always smiling. Filipinos are always just, just radiating happiness. But as I get to know Filipinos and actually have conversations and we go a little deeper, they'll go, yeah, don't be fooled by that. We're raised to be people pleasers. We're raised to keep the peace at any price. And so sometimes when there's a conflict, there's a reluctance to go, you know what, you hurt me. When you cheated on me, you broke our wedding vows and it broke my heart. And yes, I will forgive you, but do you realize the gravity, the break of trust that you've brought into our relationship? Don't minimize that. Don't jump over that hurdle as if it's just a small step. That's a big deal. And you see this balance in the life of Joseph, but the only way, reason he's able to forgive them is because of his perspective. 
You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You weren't the ones who sent me down here. God sent me ahead of you. Now, why in the world would he do that? For two years now, there's been a famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. That's really interesting. We've had famines. We've had the Dust Bowl in, in the United States. You've had hard times here. But can you imagine where you don't even bother to plant crops? Because it's just useless. The famine is that intense. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant, a leftover on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph understood that life was not about him. Here he is, this powerful man in Egypt, but he didn't see himself as the sun and everyone else orbiting around him. He saw God himself in the center of it all, and he was in orbit around God. God was the center of it all. And God had formed a covenant years ago with Father Abraham. Abraham and Sarah, I'll give you a child. Not just a child, but many descendants. In fact, someday a great nation will come from you. And I'm going to bless that nation, but that, that nation is not just my favorite. They're not my pet people. They're to be my pattern people and show the whole world how to live in relationship with me. That's God's plan. And ultimately, through one of your descendants, he will be the promised Messiah. We find out later that's Jesus Christ, whom we gather to worship today. I don't know how much of that Joseph understood, but he understood enough to know that God had made a promise, and God always finishes what he starts, and God's going to keep his promise. And when that famine hit and his family could be destroyed and starved out of existence, if that happened, the chain that would eventually lead to Messiah would be broken. So who's ultimately behind the famine? It's Satan himself. Because if Satan can starve this family into extinction, he'll rule this planet forever. But God has a plan, and so he sends Joseph ahead so that he can save the remnant. Because Satan's trying to cut down the family tree of Messiah before Jesus can be born. And God outsmarts him. And he's got Joseph in his place. He knew it wasn't about him. Verse 8, And so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all Egypt. Ellen and I have a good friend. Her name is Maggie. I share Maggie's story with, with her permission because it's a really painful story. Maggie was married to a guy who was crazy and he was mean. It's sad when you're crazy, and it's really bad when you're mean, and if you put mean and crazy together, that's a bad deal. And there was abuse, and there were broken bones during their years of marriage together, but Maggie hung in that marriage. For their 25th anniversary, her husband took her away to the beach with their three children, three teenagers by that point in their marriage. And she thought, well, at least he loves me enough to honor our 25 years together. This is going to be a great weekend away at the beach. The first night that they're there in their rented cabin at the beach, he takes a stack of papers and he opens them up and he won't even look at Maggie. He looks instead at the three children and he says, these are divorce papers. I hate your mother. I'm leaving her, I'm divorcing her, here's the agreement, get her to sign this as is. She's standing right there, but he won't speak to her. Get her to sign this as is, and make sure she understands, if she disputes so much as the placement of a comma, I will end her life. And he drops it on the counter, he walks out of the house, he gets in the car, and, and he goes back 
home, and there she is, instant single mother of three children, three teenagers. No husband, no dad. She's never worked outside the home. How is she going to support these three kids? I would love for you to see Maggie today. That probably happened when she was 45 years old. She came to work at Walk Through the Bible not long after that. In fact, there was, this was before I was there. She's been there longer than I have, and I've been there 25 years. There was discussion about should she be hired because she was just so beat up by life that what could she really offer? And one person said, I will take responsibility for her. If she does not work out well, you take my salary to pay her. Somebody took a chance on Maggie. Now Maggie's about 75. She still works for us part-time because all of us are afraid to ever let her retire because she is the very heart and soul of our ministry. And if I lined up a hundred American women across the platform and I said, which one is Maggie? You would not choose her. You'd miss her because she would be the one who stands the tallest. She would be the one who has the most dignity even at the age of 75 or so, she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. And you see no pain in her eyes at all. Everything that the enemy took away, God gave back to her. She never reconciled with that husband. God eventually took him out of this life. She married a different man who loves her in a way that every woman would dream about being loved. He's a father to her children. God rewrote the end of the story to Maggie's life. And when we finally found her and you <gasps> gasped because I didn't think it was her, she's, she's beautiful, she's regal looking. She looks like a, a queen of a nation, not an abused wife. And we gave her the microphone, she would say, you know what, I would never want to go through any of that again. That was the hardest time in my life. There were times we didn't know where the next meal would come from. We didn't know how we could pay for the small apartment that we had moved into out of our big house that he took away for, from us. There were times that I feared for my life, but you know what, as hard as that all was, I would not trade the relationship that I have with my Heavenly Father for any of that. Because it was through that time that I realized he really is the husband to the husbandless. God really is the father to the fatherless. God will supply all our needs, not our wants, but our needs in Christ Jesus. And you know what Maggie does now? Her main ministry is mentoring younger women. Victims of rape, victims of abuse, people who want no relationship with a guy ever because their hearts have been broken. And gradually over time, through the scriptures, those young women are healed. We could pass around the microphone this morning, this afternoon, and we could hear similar stories. Ah, oh, I would never want, I was so cheated in business. What happened was unfair. I would not want to go through that again. But it's through that that I felt God's new calling in my life. We could hear story after story. That's the experience of Joseph. And all the delays, all the detours were worth it because when that moment comes and he's face to face with his brothers, he's got the character to go with the power God has given him. And he chooses forgiveness rather than revenge. What's the takeaway this morning, this afternoon? We've all been mistreated at different times in our lives. For some, it's abuse at the hand of a parent, maybe sexual abuse, maybe violence, maybe just emotional abuse, maybe just constant put-downs, and you grew up in a critical environment. I have a friend that 
that his dad one day came home and brought him a little model airplane out of balsa wood. They, they spent about an hour building it together, and it's powered by a rubber band that you wind up, and they flew it across the room about three or four times. My friend was six years old at the time, and about the fourth time he wound it up and let it go, and he, he ran and he got it, and he turns to bring it back to his father, and he sees his father's legs disappearing up the stairs and his dad just kept on walking. And to this day, he's still never seen his dad again. And he's about my age. Some of you understand that level of abandonment. For some of you, it's your supervisor at work who just over and over and over took credit for your ideas. And when eventually he or she was about ready to get caught, they got rid of you. You were unjustly terminated because your boss was threatened by you. Maybe it was a close friend, a close friend that you shared a deep struggle with, and you said, you can't tell anyone this. And there you are in your D group, and your close friend says, we really need to pray for my friend right here, because she's struggling with this right now. And you look at her like, what part of the word confidential do you not understand? And you're betrayed even by a Christian brother or sister. We could go on and on and on with examples. Spouses that broke our hearts with their unfaithfulness. The question is, who's the person who has hurt you the most? Who's the person who has hurt you the most? For most of us, that's not very hard to think who that is. In fact, sometimes we have these little revenge fantasies. If I could be God for one day, I could fix some stuff in this universe of ours. And I would start by dealing with that person. God and God alone is given that authority and that power because his character can handle it. What would it look like for you to choose forgiveness over revenge? What would be the first step God would want you to take? Maybe it's writing a letter to that uncle who abused you at a family gathering years ago. Don't send an email. Write it with your own trembling hand. And don't just say, it really wasn't a big deal, I forgive you. It was a big deal, and tell him so. For some, it's apparent. Some say, well, it's too late. My mom, my dad, they're, they're dead and gone. You know what? You can forgive a dead person. Did you know that? Because it's not primarily for the other person that we forgive. Because in most cases, they're, they're moved on. And we're the ones stuck with the pain. And no prison is so confining as the, as the cell that we place ourselves into when we take the stones of unforgiveness and the mortar of bitterness and we wall ourselves out from trusting relationships. You've heard the quote before, refusing to forgive another person is like drinking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. We destroy ourselves with our unforgiveness. What would it look like? Maybe it's a letter. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's a face-to-face -face meeting. Maybe you say, I can't, even, I can't even comprehend forgiving. I will never forgive because I will never forget. Today can be the start of that process as we open our hearts. In a minute, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, we're going to have a song. And you can, during that song, you can do business with God right where you are. You can take that person who has hurt you, and you can take them to the throne, and you, you can ask God to give you the supernatural ability to forgive. Well, I can't forgive. Yeah, we can, except if one thing is missing, if we've never received forgiveness. If we've received his forgiveness, 
for our sin by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, if we've been forgiven that level of debt, my hell-deserving sins, because I've done a lot worse things than steal a stupid baseball glove along the way. And God's forgiven me that because Jesus took the death penalty I've deserved. You can receive his death in your place today. For those of us who know him, we still struggle with forgiving other people, don't we? And you can deal with God right where you sit, but for many of you, you need somebody to help you get over that, that hump, somebody to help you take the first step. Because this has been this has been holding you back in your growth and your relationship with Christ and your growth with other, other people that you love to be closer to, but you protect yourselves because you're reluctant to trust. There's going to be some of the pastors and other spiritual leaders from here at CCF are going to be spread across the front. You come. You come. You tell them what the issue is. You don't need to give them all the gory details, but let them pray for you. And today is the breakthrough day where we begin to experience the freedom that we have in Christ so that like Joseph we can say you meant it for evil I would never want to go through that again but you know what I see the hand of God in it and I trust him that he really does cause all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose so you come if the spirit prompts you father Thank you for the life of Joseph. Thank you for this powerful story. We sometimes think that he's a superhero who never struggled, but that's not true. There was a depth to the conflict that was raging in his own soul, and yet he decided to trust you. He decided to let you be God. And Lord, today I pray that we will take a step of faith to be a little more like Joseph, to trust the work that you have not yet completed in us, that we would take a step toward forgiveness, even to this person who has hurt us more than any person on earth. Lord, don't let us carry that burden out of here. If we need to receive you as Savior, may today be that day, because it's impossible to forgive others until we've received your forgiveness. Lord, bless those who pray in their seats, but especially honor, honor the faith of those who come and ask for help from another person. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ, who makes all reconciliation possible, I pray. Amen. Let's all stand now and give Honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who want to be prayed over, we invite you to come up front now while we sing. To the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. To the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. To the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. To the King, Invisible, the only God, be the honor and glory forever and ever. Glory. 
Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. Honor and glory be to you. If you're our guest here, you're here with us for the first time, we invite you also to, um, to our welcome center. We have some snacks for you there. Thank you. God bless you.